What is social investment? Social investment is the use of money to achieve both a social and financial return. The financial return is measured using a conventional approach, looking at the spread to some risk-free index or the internal rate of return. But a return from the social impact delivered by the investment is added to that financial return to allow an overall comparison with the risk incurred. The basis on which social impact is measured will vary somewhat from one social investment fund to another. But funds look at the extent to which the investment is additive in terms of well-being. Social investment conferences happen almost weekly around the world, allowing participants in social markets to compare grids and quantitative measures. They seek to quantify a somewhat qualitative measure. The social investment market has developed in the form we now recognize over the past 20 years, but it has its roots in an older philanthropy. In the UK, for example, Big Society Capital, BSC, a government-sponsored advisor and fund of funds in social investment, argues that the long history of social investment can be traced back to Elizabethan England and early charities. The activity evolved through cooperative and mutual societies to credit unions, then social lenders and microfinance. In short, the social investment firms of the 21st century were not invented overnight. Social investment is an attractive source of funding for social organizations that struggle to access finance from banks due to lack of assets that can be secured. The lending can be used for cash flow support, refurbishments, transitions to new business models, property and other asset acquisitions, occasionally financial rescues. Terms and conditions will often be more flexible than those facilitated by traditional commercial banks or new algorithmic fintech lenders. Loan to value and financial covenants may well be more forgiving to reflect the impact being generated and the small size of some of the borrowers. Loans versus grants for a charity, social enterprise. Traditionally, charities have been able to fund themselves by raising grants from government-sponsored commissioners of services or from private donations, legacies, and fundraising events. In the UK and elsewhere, many of these sources have been severely strained since the financial crisis of 2008. Since then, there has been a prolonged period of austerity the UK government has pared back government expenditure on welfare and other items to reduce the fiscal deficit. Local authority funding has been especially impacted, with central government funding reduced by about 40% since 2010. Charities and social enterprises have moved into services previously provided by government. They have tendered for contracts with local authorities, which act as commissioner and obligor. Under these contracts, the charity now delivers services to the vulnerable. This has required working capital finance as charities have sought to expand their role. Further complicating matters, local authorities and other commissioners have delayed payments under these contracts. They have borne down on any profit margin that might be extracted by the charity. Sometimes they have introduced payment by results contracts. In short, the financial requirements of charities have increased as grant funding has dried up. This is where social investment has stepped in to take up the slack. These social investors make loans with traditional terms and conditions. Usually a fixed or variable rate of interest, some light financial and other covenants, and of course the requirement to repay at the end of the loan. This is more onerous than grant funding, which is sometimes viewed as the equivalent of equity finance for a charity. But it also has advantages. It imposes on the charity a financial rigor that may allow the charity to become more sustainable. The charity can use this discipline to identify service-related cash flows that have some reliability. This allows them to budget for debt service and principal repayment. In fact, Grants often have debt-like characteristics for the charity. For example, if they are financing an asset purchase like a property, they will often have a security interest. Equally, there can be clawbacks 
such that the grant must be repaid if the associated service is not adequately delivered. This would tend to include failure to deliver through insolvency. Hence, grant providers will frequently occupy a seat at the senior creditor's table in administration proceedings. From the perspective of the social investor, the sustainability that debt discipline can provide is an aspect of their social impact. This aspect can appeal to philanthropists as funders of social investment funds. By contrast, with grants, the money that goes out the door can be difficult to follow. Grants can be associated with uncertain tangible results. Yet the philanthropic social investor can view debt as akin to recyclable grants, where the principal of the loan is repaid, the capital contributed to the fund is typically invested in another charity or social enterprise to accumulate greater impact over a wider horizon. How can a charity sustain a loan and credit? Famously, the world's most successful financial investor, Warren Buffett, expressed skepticism on social investment. He questioned the capacity of charities to run themselves like businesses, a necessary condition for the incurrence of debt. In particular, in 2013, Buffett expressed his dilemma thus. I think it's tough to serve two masters. If I set up an objective of running a business as well as I can, I have to work through hundreds or thousands of people to get my objectives achieved. I think giving them two different goals can be tough. So I think I would rather have the investing produce the capital to then have an organization totally focused on the philanthropic aspects. Buffett, no fan of social investment, but he has instead gifted a large share of his legacy to the primarily grant giving Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Certainly, lending to a charity as though it were a business demands a great deal of thought. In fact, social investment fund managers will carry out a comparable level of credit analysis on a charity to that of a traditional credit fixed income asset manager. The amounts being lent are often a fraction of the size, but the damage caused by making poor credit decisions are amplified by the impact on vulnerable people who may lose their entire support mechanism. Equally, the charity is likely to have credit characteristics that are distinct from companies, making the credit profile weaker. For example, charities have no means of raising conventional equity, but instead rely on building up reserves through surpluses or by attracting grant funding. At the same time, they are reticent to build substantial reserves since this can inhibit future grant funders from giving. Funders may view large reserves at the charity as a sign that the charity has less need for scarce grants. Other donors may have similar concerns. This leads to a requirement to maintain unrestricted reserves and cash at a maximum of three to six months of operating costs. Reserves, unlike a company's equity base, are simply a buffer to manage short-term crises. In fact, charities will often maintain property valuations at historical book levels to disguise real reserves. This means that conventional gearing levels at charities that borrow can be very high, but work needs to be done to analyze opaque balance sheets. At the same time, charities may have less continuity of cash flows in a company. Contract payments from local authorities are uncertain, and commissioners are prone to cancel contracts unexpectedly. Furthermore, the burden that charities have taken on from government during austerity has left these not-for-profit institutions still more exposed with other liabilities. For example, in bidding to provide traditional welfare services from local authorities, some have incurred onerous defined benefit pension obligations in pooled local authority pension schemes. At worst, these liabilities can be last man standing with the requirement to pick up the payments of failed members of the scheme. So, the credit analyst looking at charities needs to be alert to risks that amplify traditional credit risk. In small and medium-sized charities, where the impact for investors can be greatest, the profile and experience of the CEO and key trustees is indispensable for the business. 
continuous financial scrutiny at board level and the charity's philanthropic profile can temper worries around high leverage and vulnerable cash flows. But as Kids Company and other high profile failures have shown, charismatic leadership is not enough. Transparency around financial sustainability and social impact is essential. Kids Company, after all, spent nearly 50 million pounds of government money by appealing to a celebrity funding culture removed from any proper scrutiny. The financial and impact scrutiny which accompanies the provision of social investment arguably makes these accidents less likely. Types of social investment. Many of the core products in the armory of a social investor would be familiar to any financial markets practitioner. Senior debt. A charity can incur senior secured or unsecured debt. This would extend from short-term working capital facilities to 40-year mortgages on properties. Junior, subordinated debt. With an intercreditor agreement, this can slot in beneath senior debt with repayment only after the settling of senior obligations. Interest rates might average 8 to 9% for small charities versus 5 to 6% at the senior level. Charity bonds. This looks like a corporate bearer bond with annual coupons, standard bond documentation, including generic covenants, and sometimes security. The issuer is a regulated charity or social enterprise. Liquidity of the bonds is often low with investors looking to buy and hold. The overall market size remains small with only 135 million pounds outstanding by year end 2017. Charities also have access to other forms of finance which are bespoke to the sector. Social impact bonds. In 2010, Peterborough Prison issued the first SIB with a coupon linked to the rate of reoffending on the release of cohorts of prisoners. The bond was repaid seven years later with a 3% return. This innovation in not-for-profit financing was an attempt to tie social investors into the outcomes that followed from their investment. It relies on an arrangement described as payment by results. SIBs combine three principles in each transaction. The commissioner defines outcomes to deliver an improvement in the chosen cohort. Deals have been done around prison offenders, health, employment, education, and social exclusion. The commissioner will often be a local authority, government department, or institution like the big lottery fund. Next, the delivery partners are the charity or social enterprise that seeks to deliver the service that will provide improved outcomes. The service needs to be measurable and easy to administer. In health and education, for example, this may simply mean patients and learners showing up for sequential meetings, accumulating coupons as they move through the treatment, therapy, or lessons. Finally, the investors will analyze the special purpose vehicle, or SPV, where they lend, in terms of the integrity of contracts and deliverability of the outcomes. Investors will want to know that the arrangement delivers good without being too complicated or costly. As in many aspects of social investments, scalability of these financings can be challenging. SIBs are complicated. This means that structuring and legal costs are high and need to be spread over a significant size of bond or loan. Development impact bonds. This is similar to the SIB, but uses payment by results in the context of development projects. Commissioners here might be supranational development banks and outcomes might be linked to improved agricultural initiatives or climate change impact. There have been few DIBs closed thus far. Lead times on these deals can be slow with foreign exchange and legal complications. Community share issues. These are equity units issued by a community benefit society that allow individuals and institutions to invest in a local enterprise. They are normally raised in small denominations with a maximum single investment of up to 100,000 pounds using a crowdfunding platform. The shares are technically redeemable with notice, but the issuer can decline to redeem due to insufficient financial resources. 
In that sense, CSIs represent permanent capital. The CSIs pay a rate of interest typically in the range of 2 to 5%. Revenue participation agreements. A loan that receives a rate of return based on some performance milestone, typically revenue-based. This is again an attempt to construct quasi-equity in the not-for-profit sector. This is the end of part one. In part two, we will look at types of social investors, the whole area of ESG, and a real-life example of a social investment fund.